everyone. So <clears throat> let's carry on with the questions. Uh, and uh, I'm guessing these ones are the ones from yesterday, so we'll do those first. Uh, and there's heaps of new questions, which is great. <laughs> it's always nice to see people are engaged. That's a good thing. So let's um, see what we have today. Uh, Okay, dear Martin, many thanks for your really inspiring teachings. Uh, yesterday you said something along the lines of that Abhidhamma was not taught by the Buddha. Could you please explain why you think so? It is well known that Lord Buddha preached the Abhidhamma to the Devas. Uh, <laughs> yes, and the three Pitakas were mentioned in the first Buddhist council. As far as I know, so the third one must be the Abhidhamma, isn't that right? Leaving aside whether the Lord Buddha taught it or not for a bit, uh, could you mention any problems you find with the teachings of the Abhidhamma? And also, if you reckon there are any contradictions in the Abhidhamma to the, compared to the Sutta Pitaka? Um, all right, so um, um, is it later than the Suttas or is it uh, not taught by the Buddha? I think the evidence for that is actually very strong. Yeah. And uh, there's all kinds of evidence. One part of the evidence is that there are Abhidhammas of different recensions. And so you find Abhidhammas in the different schools of Buddhism. So you have the Theravada Abhidhamma, you have the Sarvastivadan Abhidhamma in Chinese. You have part of the Dharma Guptaka Abhidhamma also in Chinese translation. And if you compare these Abhidhammas, they're very different. And so why are they different? Well, they're different obviously because they were largely invented or written by those different schools. Uh, and because it happened after the schools had separated, uh, yeah, they became very different. Whereas the suttas, if you look at the suttas of the same schools, uh, they are very much the same. So they have a common core, they originated from common uh, ancestor, which would have been the Buddha, whereas the Abhidhamma did not. Uh, so you have far more separation in the Abhidhammas uh, than you have in the suttas. Uh, and that is why the further away you get from the Buddha, you start reading things like the commentaries. Yeah, the commentaries in the Pali are completely different from the commentaries in other schools uh, because they were specifically written in that school. They don't go back to the Buddha, they don't go back to a common ancestor. Yeah. So we know that the Abhidhamma, from that reason alone, is really sufficient to conclude that uh, it was not taught by the Buddha. It was taught maybe two, three, four hundred years after the Buddha, something like that, uh, in the various schools. Uh, then you can look at the actual language uh, of the Abhidhamma, uh, and it is very clear that the language is very different from the language of the suttas. Uh, the style is very different, there's different vocabulary, even some of the grammatical expressions are different. Uh, uh, the, you know, the, the whole thing just feels like it comes from a different author. Uh, if you take the uh, English language, for example, uh, and you compare modern English and you compare it to someone like Charles Dickens, uh, and you straight away, if you re read Charles Dickens, you get the feeling that it's not the same English, right? It is more archaic, it is older. Uh, language changes over time. You know that uh, there is an evolution going on. Pali is exactly the same. Yeah, you can feel that there is an evolution in the language. It changes over time. If you go back to Shakespeare, then it's very different from, or quite different from modern English. You can still read it, but the way it is expressed is quite different. So uh, it is not hard to see that there is an evolution in the language. It cannot have been from the Buddha. It obviously came a long time afterwards. The ideas expressed as an evolution in ideas, which is also what you would expect uh, yeah, over time. Uh, there's a new way of thinking about the Dhamma. Uh, it's more about being comprehensive and complete, filling in the gaps of the, or of the early teachings. Uh, and all of these things make it very obvious. I don't, as far as I can see, there cannot really be an argument about that. Yes, it is said that the Buddha taught it to the devas, to me that is another argument why it is late, right? Why would he teach it to the devas? It doesn't really make any sense, it sounds like an excuse. That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah, he taught the devas, that's why we don't really have any clear, you know, it is, sounds a bit weird, it, it couldn't really be attributed to being taught to a human being, so we have some weird explanation for how it works. 
And so it was told to his mother in the Tabatengsa heaven, is the traditional story. That traditional story is found in the commentaries to the Abhidhamma, in the work called the Atta Salini. So how can we trust that that is true? You probably can't, yeah? because why would the commentaries have a proper understanding of the origins of the Abhidhamma if it is not, if it doesn't come in the suttas? So the whole idea that the Abhidhamma is the word of the Buddha is very on very, very thin ice. Uh, in fact, so thin that the ice is uh, breaking all the time. Uh, um, so, uh, that is where that, uh, that uh, myth comes from. It comes from the commentaries to the Abhidhamma that the Buddha taught these things to the, to the Devas. Uh, it is not mentioned in the First Buddhist Council. Yeah, it, is, it is not there, which is also another indication why it's late. In the First Council, only the uh, five Nikayas uh, and the Vinaya is mentioned, not the Abhidhamma, right? So that's another kind of important point. Uh, so uh, it is left out. Uh, in some of the various schools, uh, even the five Nikayas are not mentioned, only the four Nikayas and the Vinaya, uh, and the, because the uh, uh, Kudaka Nikaya itself is a quite a late development. Uh, um, is there any problems with the Abhidhamma? And, uh, if you reckon there are any contradictions with the Abhidhamma to the Sutta Pitika, it depends what you mean by Abhidhamma, because the canonical Abhidhamma is really very, it's a very dry kind of thing, and it's just a list of uh, ideas and a list of mind states and a list of uh, physical, for phys, you know, physical phenomena. That's really what it is. It's like a long listing, and then it kind of, first of all, it analyzes the mind and physical phenomena into its components. Uh, and then it synthesizes it or brings it together according to causality as the work of the Patana, which is the seventh book of the Abhidhamma. So the Dhammasangini, Dhammasangini literally means the enumeration of Dhammas. And Sangani is to count, the arrow to enumerate. And Dhamma is kind of the states of the mind. So one is like the enumeration of the Dhammas, which is like pulling apart reality into its kind of constituent details, a bit like what we're trying to do with the periodic table and that sort of stuff, quarks and that kind of thing. Yeah. These are the quarks of the Buddhism. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Buddhism was there first. Uh, so the quarks of Buddhism, that's what we have here. Yeah. And then we put, and then we sh show the relationships between those quarks. Yeah. Yeah? And that's kind of the, uh, the f laws of physics that show the relationships between you know, the strong force and the weak force and gravity and this kind of stuff. Uh, and that's the patana which does that. So analysis and synthesis, or however we want to call this. So it is it is very hard to say whether it contradicts the suttas or not, because it's kind of a different kind of presentation. But it certainly adds things to the suttas. It analyzes things in a new way. And uh, and some of the things in there arguably do contradict the suttas, but. When we talk about Abhidhamma, what we normally mean is the canonical Abhidhamma and the commentaries to the Abhidhamma. Because the Abhidhamma as such is very hard to make much sense of without the commentaries. Uh. <coughs> so whenever you hear an exposition about the Abhidhamma, you're not actually hearing an exposition about the Abhidhamma at all. Uh. What you're hearing is exposition of the commentaries to the Abhidhamma, which are even later again. Uh. Right? Uh. So this is talking about uh, many, many centuries, maybe a millennium after the Buddha himself. Uh, so are there any contradictions between the commentaries uh, and the suttas? Uh, and uh, I would say uh, that there is uh, contradictions, yeah? and uh, the contradictions are things like they are starting to have this idea of sabhava, for example. Sabhava means inherent uh, quality, existent quality of something. Yeah? In other words, things start to have inherent qualities. Uh, and this is what the Buddha kind of refuses in the suttas. Yeah, nothing really has an inherent quality. An inherent quality is moving towards the idea of a self, yeah? something which is substantial or whatever. Yeah? And this is one of some of the great arguments that they had between the various schools with these kind of arguments. Do things have inherent qualities or not? Uh, Sarvastivadans arguing with the Theravadans, Theravadans arguing with the Dharmaguptaka, who is right? Uh, Sarvastivadans have their own problems. Uh, Sarva Astivada means the doctrine that everything exists. Yeah? Sounds, even the name sounds a bit suspicious. <laughs> everything exists, all right? What, what does that mean there? And then they heard the Pukalavada, which is the doctrine of the person, the idea that there is a person that is somehow beyond the five aggregates. Uh, 
we can see why there's lots of problems here and lots of uh, potential uh, flaws. So what I would say, instead of even deciding whether the Abhidhamma is right or not, and probably, like everywhere else, there probably are some good ideas, some bad ideas, yeah, everything is a bit like that. Uh, more important is just to realize it's not the word of the Buddha. Uh, we don't know whose word the Abhidhamma is. We don't know where it came from. Uh, I would say most likely it did not come from Aryans and noble people, because noble people, I don't think they would sit down and write this kind of treatises on philosophy. They wouldn't be interested in that. Uh, and so I would say probably it comes from some restless person who doesn't, you know. <laughs> I think a lot of these kind of teachings, they came out of restlessness. Uh, yeah. Maybe that's why I, I spent too much time <laughs> translating as well. <laughs> I don't know. So but these things come out of restlessness very often. Then. Yeah, and people who are noble, they are not interested in that sort of thing. They're interested in meditation and chilling and just having a good time and teaching maybe, but not adding things uh, so much. Uh, so I would say, because we don't know where it comes from, because it is hard work to figure out whether it contradicts the suttas or not, uh, because uh, sometimes there is grounds for suspicion, uh, I would say, put it to one side. It is necessary. Uh, have you read all the suttas yet? Uh, if not, stick to the suttas. Uh, read them once, twice, three times, four times, uh, before you take an interest in the Abhidhamma. Uh, anyway, that's my take on that. So you can make of it what you like. Uh, go on to the next one. Uh, over the last year, I have been uh, working my way through your lecture series on the Noble Eightfold Path, Satipatthana, etc. I've been practicing Buddhism more than 20 years, and these courses have been some of, if not the most helpful talks I have listened to for clarifying the Buddha's teaching. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Well, that's really cool, isn't it? I'm very, very happy to hear that. Because that is what we, we aim to please, you see. <laughs> <laughs> So if we can please, actually what we really aim for is obviously to present the Buddha's teachings as they are, and it is, we try our very best to come from the suttas when we teach, and not to teach based on other things. And I think that is kind of one of the reasons why these particular series of talk actually talk to people in a very good way, because it is based on the word of the Buddha. And having worked on this for decades now, you know, you have a certain advantage in uh, having all that uh, accumulated knowledge of the suttas, and you can then present it out again, regurgitate it uh, through your own words. Uh, and so I'm very happy to hear that that is the case. So thank you for that very kind comment of yours. Uh, we shall aim and try to do more of these things in the future. There will be another short series coming up soon in July. We have already one, uh, which will be the factors number nine and ten on the Noble Eightfold Path, no, on the Tenfold Path. <laughs> Factor nine and ten of the Eightfold Path. I'm not sure if that is a very meaningful <laughs> statement. <laughs> okay. Dear Ajahn, thank you for your teachings. Uh, you, can you please explain how the cultivation of the Brahma Viharas relates to the Anapanasati meditation and the path to awakening? Is the awakening factor of equanimity the same as the fourth Brahma Vihara? Yes, it is basically the same thing. Uh, because the um, awakening factor of awakening comes after Samadhi. So you have the Samadhi Sambhojanga, the awakening factor of stillness, and then you have the Upeka Sambhojanga, the awakening factor of equanimity, or even the mind, or however you want to put it. So it's very, very high up there. In the same way, the idea of Upeka is also there. So how does it relate to um, Anapanasati? <coughs> well, first of all, kind of if you do the practice the Brahma Viharas, Metta, Karuna, Mudita, and Upeka, if you practice those kind of as a ordinary meditation subjects, uh, they help you to purify the mind. Yeah? If you have a lot of Metta in daily life and all of these kind of things, and you do that in meditation, uh, then uh, it has this uh, ability to purify you. Uh, the more powerful your metta is, uh, the less ill will you will have in ordinary life. If your metta is fully developed, you will never have any ill will at all. That is the promise of the suttas. Uh, full development of metta, you never have ill will. Uh, of course, you have to keep at it. Uh, yeah? if, you, uh, if you kind of let it go for a while, uh, then the ill will will re-arise. Uh, but if you keep on regularly practicing this, uh, 
You will never have any ill will. Always have kindness and compassion for people. Huh? So it's a very high degree of purity. Huh? But uh, remember that uh, metta begins with how you speak and how you act towards other people. The Buddha talks about actions and speech of metta in the suttas, uh, and then thoughts of metta. Huh? And then when these things come together, that is where meditation on metta starts to become really powerful because you have laid, laid the groundwork. Yeah? So metta begins by action and speech. Then in how you think, which is really right effort, then it comes into meditation. Uh, yeah? And uh, especially after the mind has become quite peaceful, uh, then that is where metta and compassion can become powerful. Uh, sometimes it can be hard if the mind is not... Uh, isn't really ready, ready for it. So then you can use that metta, and if you use it well, you can use it to become very peaceful. You can use it for nimittas, and if the nimittas, the bright lights, arise through metta, then you can use those lights to enter jhana states. And of course, if you use metta and compassion to enter the jhana states, there will sometimes there will be a residue left when you come out. Yeah. Because that, some of that metta will still be there when you emerge from the jhana states. So, and so you will kind of have an extra power to it. And then you can carry on, if you like, after the jhana with more metta. And that is where you can overcome ill will for very long periods of time because of the power of metta after samadhi. Yeah. So in this way, they have, there's a little bit of before samadhi and after samadhi yeah, when you practice uh, these Brahma Viharas in this way. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so anyway, I'm not sure exactly if that is what you were asking, but uh, something like that, yeah. And, um, yeah, okay. Dear Ajahn, thank you for your wonderful explanation of how to interpret the insights. Uh, Sadhu times three. Okay, good. So, um, Question, uh, linking to the Anapanasati Sutta, can you please explain again how to see the impermanence of perception and consciousness aggregates? Uh, also, how Nibbita and Viraga sequence leads to letting go. Uh, is this uh, to liberate from Dukkha by eradicating craving uh, so we don't cling to anything, uh, especially the five aggregates. Is this why they call it the five clinging aggregates? Uh, thank you. Um, all right, so uh, how to see the impermanence of perception and consciousness. Uh, so as you, perception is very broad, right? So uh, uh, perception can mean so many different things in your meditation, uh, but things are always changing and things are always uh, ceasing. Uh, in your perceptions as you meditate. So for example, one example of perception could simply be the body. Yeah? The fact that you are aware of the body is also a perception. So you can use that as an example of perception. So your body fades away. That is a kind of perception fading away. Your body ceases in meditation. That is a kind of perception ceasing in meditation. Right? These are the perceptions related to the five senses. If all the five senses cease, then all perceptions related to the five senses cease. If you see images in your mind, images that you see in your mind, it could be anything like a landscape or a person or whatever, images may come up, and then as you keep focusing on the breath or you focus on a nimitta or whatever, those images start to cease. That is a perception fading away and then ceasing. Yeah, so everything, everything can be regarded as a perception almost. Perception is just the ability to know something, the ability to distinguish something from something else. Uh, perception is what enables us to make sense of reality, uh, how we classify things. We see people as friends and enemies, or we see things as people and carpets and whatever it is. Uh, so, um, uh, and all of these things become simplified in meditation. Yeah? Simpler and simpler and simpler. Uh, more and more things fading away, your perceptions fading away, uh, eventually ceasing completely. Uh, and that simplicity means that uh, uh, means that a lot of things are fading away, basically. Uh. Does that make sense? Then eventually you have the perception of the nimitta, the light in the mind. Uh, it's kind of the last perception that you kind of 
uh, have with you of the five sense world. Uh, and then and as you kind of uh, go into a jhana state, that, that perception too ceases, is gone. Uh, yeah? Another perception ceasing. Yeah? So this is the idea of uh, perception cease, fading away and ceasing. Yeah? And then you go into more jhanas, you know, deeper and deeper, and, and other perceptions are ceasing. The perception of vitaka vichara, the movement of the mind ceases. The perception of piti, yeah, one of the types of happiness ceases. Uh, sukha ceases, uh, one thing after the other. And then if you have consciousness, so in consciousness, uh, uh, there's six classes of consciousness according to the suttas, uh, one for each of the five senses uh, and one for the mind. Uh, so when you enter a Jhana state, five kinds of consciousness have ceased completely. Yeah. So when you come out of jhana, you know that these, you know, the five senses are, you know, they can be abandoned completely, and all that is left is mind consciousness. And so you understand, you start to understand about the cessation of consciousness. And then as you go through the various kind of jhanas, then aspects of mind consciousness is also given up. Uh, yeah, so consciousness itself is becoming simplified, or the content of consciousness is becoming simplified, uh, as if you're uh, cutting things off. Uh, and so gradually, uh, you know, you, the penny starts to drop, that consciousness itself is completely impermanent, uh, arisen due to cause and conditions. Uh, and um, uh, which is quite e much more easy when you come to the jhanas, because you have given up the vast majority of the world already, uh, all that is left when it comes to the jhanas is a bit of bliss, not a bit of bliss, massive amounts of bliss. That is all that is left. And so all you then have to understand is the conditioned reality of that bliss. And when you get that after a while, then it's when you're able to see through all the five khandas. Because consciousness is conjoined with that bliss. If you understand the bliss itself as impermanent and conditioned, the consciousness too must be conditioned and impermanent, because uh, these things do not really exist apart from each other. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, once you have seen all the five khandas as impermanent, uh, then you also understand that they are suffering. Yeah. Yeah, anything that's impermanent is suffering because uh, you cannot hold on to it. Uh, even if you get the jhana state, it will not last for eternity. You're going to have to come back to these blooming five senses again. Oh no, the five senses. Oh, so much dukkha. Uh, cannot hold on to the jhanas, right? Uh, that's real dukkha for you. Imagine you experience the highest bliss possible in the universe uh, and you have to come back to your ordinary existence again. Uh, isn't that terrible? Uh? Yeah, finally got something really worthwhile. You cannot have it. It's just impossible. That is dukkha. And then when you kind of that, you understand that. When that really sinks in, you understand that actually the five aggregates are dukkha. The moment you understand the five aggregates are dukkha, your hand withdraws from the hot plate. Your mind withdraws from the five aggregates. Yeah, because it cannot bear it anymore. How can you attach to dukkha? There's no way. You lose your interest in the five aggregates, uh, and that is where craving comes to an end. Uh, that losing of interest is nibida. You feel an aversion. Ah, oh, it's like oh, you pull back. Yeah, yeah? attachment goes. Uh, craving for the five aggregates is gone. Uh, your mind pulls back, yeah? and uh, if you do that a few times, eventually craving gets completely annihilated because you cannot crave for dukkha. Uh, and so the aggregates are still here, but you're, not, you're no longer attached to them. You no longer crave for them. You just have to experience them until you die. That's kind of what the Arahant does. Does that make sense? That's kind of how, that's, that's how, I, understand, how I understand this. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, they're called the five clinging aggregates because precisely we cling to them. It's those clinging aggregates that are the problem. Yeah, they punch upadana kanda. Now this called them, but upadana is grasping and clinging. Yeah. Kanda yeah, are these uh, aggregates, so-called aggregates. Not sure if I like that word. To be honest, aggregate. I don't know. Anyway, uh, that's what's being used these days. So we just uh, use it. it. It kind of means aggregate because it means a conglomeration or a group of. Phenomen phenomena together. So it kind of aggregate is not wrong, yeah. But these days the word aggregate is often used when you make concrete. Yeah, you put kind of sand and stones and that's kind of aggregate you put into the concrete. Yeah. So when I hear aggregate, I think I think you know gravel or something. That's what I think when I hear the word aggregate. But anyway, that's not what it means in this case. Uh, so um, 
the five, yeah, no. Anyway, okay, next question. What did you mean by Vipassana doesn't exist? It's a marketing ploy here. Ooh, someone didn't like that one. Okay, ooh. <laughs> what, I, what I meant is just that uh, uh, the way, you know, when you read the suttas, you start to see how the Buddha uses these words, right? And that is kind of very interesting here. Because the Buddha does not use the word vipassana as a meditation technique. He uses the word vipassana as a result of meditation. There are two results of meditation. One is samatha, which is calm. The other is vipassana, which is clear seeing. These are the results. Meditation is really only one in the suttas. All you do is watch the breath. And if you do meditation in the right way, if you watch the breath, and you succeed with that uh, because you have built up the right cause or whatever, you get these two results. Uh, breath meditation gives rise to both samatha and vipassana. Why? Because when you feel calm, you see clearly. When you see, see clearly, uh, you feel calm. They always have to go together. They're two sides of the same knife or coin or whatever you want to say. Uh, so they cannot really be separated. Uh. So uh, what I meant is that when people talk about vipassana meditation, uh, it's, uh, I said marketing, because it sounds good, right? Insight meditation. Who doesn't want insight? Uh? But uh, it doesn't mean that there is a particular kind of meditation that is for insight and another which is for calm. There is one kind of meditation, both leading to the same thing. Uh, one kind of meditation leading to the two results, uh, yeah? Calm and insight. Uh. And the reason for that is because the causes for clear seeing and the causes for calm are the same. What is the purpose of meditation? What is the purpose of the whole path? It is to reduce your defilement, it is to purify the mind so you can have deep insight into the nature of reality. This is, the, this is why it's called the path of purification, right? The Visuddhi Magga is a name for the path and the Visuddhi Magga does not apply really to that work that we have in Theravadan Buddhism. Visuddhimagga really applies to the Noble Eightfold Path. It is all about purifying yourself. Virtue, learning how to think in the right way, then meditation practice. And if you purify, if you reduce the defilements in your mind, it has two consequences. If the less defilements you have, the more peaceful you feel, the more calm you feel, because defilements take you away from peace. Yeah? Defilements are agitating, yeah? they are restless, uh, they drive you into the future and the past. Uh. So by reducing defilements, uh, you become more peaceful and calm. Uh. But by reducing defilements, you also see more clearly, uh, because the defilements give you a vested interest in the world. Uh. If you have a desire for something, you cannot see it clearly because you want it. You, have a, you will see the positive aspects in something that you like. You cannot see it for what it actually is. There's a vested interest in that thing. If you are angry with someone, it's the same thing. You have a vested interest in not liking them. You can't see a person you're angry with in a neutral way. It's absolutely impossible. So we are biased when the defilements are there. So if you reduce the defilements, you are less biased. And you can see things for the, what they actually are. The last and most important bias is the sense of self. The sense of self will not allow you to see dukkha fully because you have a vested interest in seeing the happiness in the self. Yeah? A self that is pure dukkha is unbearable. It doesn't make any sense. So... If you reduce the defilements, uh, you see more clearly. If you reduce the defilements, uh, you become more calm. Uh, the whole path is about reducing defilements. Uh, and so it gives rise to these two results, vipassana and samatha. By reducing defilements, uh, they have the same cause, the same condition that leads to both. Uh, so whatever you do on the path that reduces defilements uh, is going to give rise to samatha and vipassana. Mindfulness meditation, meditation on the breath, should reduce the defilements. So it will lead to samatha and vipassana. It's quite, it is quite kind of, uh, once you sort of see it, it's quite uh, obvious in my opinion. Uh, and uh, in also all meditation is insight meditation. Do we do vipassana meditation here? Of course we do vipassana meditation here. Uh, yeah? Hopefully you've got lots of vipassana when you leave this retreat in a few days. Probably have some already. So of course it is, uh, 
But the Vipassana meditation, we go to the Vipassana center, that is also Samatha meditation, because they cannot be divided. So when the people say, oh, they do Samatha meditation, we do Vipassana meditation, actually we're doing the same thing here. Okay, I hope you, uh, if you're not happy with that answer, please, uh, you're very welcome to try again now. <laughs> so uh, let's go on to the uh, latest questions from uh, today, presumably. So, dear Ajahn, uh, Ajahn early mentioned at uh, some stage during the meditation the feelings or sensations of the body will start to disappear. That sounds frightening. Yeah. <laughs> Can Ajahn please advise how one should overcome this fear and proceed with uh, the meditation? Is there no bliss at this stage? Uh, e.g. you become aware you can't wriggle your toes uh, or fingers. Help! Do these sensations come back and when? <laughs> should one still carry on with the meditation knowing one has lost control? And where does one gain back control? Please advise that. Also, does one uh, have to be fully aware of what is happening if to reflect at the end? Okay, so where do we start with this? Um, so, um, yeah, it, it is, the thing is that these things may sound frightening in theory, but in practice they are really delightful. And this is often the problem with meditation theory. If you hear the things on the Buddhist path, they can sound pretty scary because you have to let go of the things that seem so dear to you, like the sense of self. You have to let go of your body and all of those attachments, all these things that are so important to you in the world. All of these things can sound scary until you experience it. And when you experience it, actually you wonder why on earth you ever were scared about these things. Because these are the most beautiful things that can happen to you. The body is a nuisance, yeah? and you don't get that until you actually experience the disappearing of the body. Yeah? And then you say, yay, body gone, whoa, so happy. Yeah? <laughs> that is kind of the idea here. Yeah? So don't worry about it, don't try to figure it out beforehand. Yeah? Just make sure that your meditation is going in the right way. Are you becoming more peaceful? Are you enjoying what you're doing? Yeah? Just go with the joy and the peace. Yeah? And I guarantee you that you will kind of, after a while, you will see how, what a wonderful thing it is, uh, what a blessing it is uh, that the body disappears. Uh. Yeah, you don't, so don't worry about it beforehand. Uh, uh, just uh, deal with it when you get there. Uh, and then you, I think you will be, you will be fine. Uh. Uh, so that is how you overcome that one. Uh. Uh, and yes, there tends to be bliss already, happiness already when the body disappears, so you will be very, very happy and very, you will not worry at all about the body, basically. Uh, and uh, the wriggle in your toes, you don't even want to wriggle your toes, uh, you <laughs> so you will be fine. Uh, um, and uh, yes, the sensations come back, you will still be able to wriggle your toes afterwards, uh, so you, you, know, you just have a small holiday from wriggling your toes. Uh. <laughs> And uh, so, uh, yeah, so you still carry on and, uh, yeah, you don't, don't worry about it. And these things will be, will, you will just, I guarantee you that you will enjoy this as it comes. Just go slowly, yeah, don't go too fast uh, and just feel comfortable with every stage. Uh, and as you do this, you, uh, you will have no problems at all. Uh, um, yes, you have to have full awareness. Uh, what's happening to reflect back, and this is kind of the idea of mindfulness, uh, is that you have full awareness, right? So you, sh you should ideally have full awareness uh, as you meditate, uh, because uh, in fact the awareness should be stronger and stronger as your meditation proceeds. Uh, you have more and more clarity about what is going on. Uh, that is really what this is about. So if you feel that you're losing your clarity and awareness, uh, it means that you are not really quite on the right track. Uh, Take a step back, re-establish your mindfulness again. Uh, yeah, you're probably the mind is going into a bit of tiredness and lethargy or whatever, uh, and you're losing your clarity of the mind. Uh, you want the feeling should be that you're more and more clear. Awareness gets stronger and stronger as you do this. Uh, that is what it should feel like. Uh. All right. Uh, 
people never liked me. Really? Okay, gee. Is that a result of really bad karma? Um, okay, people never liked me. Okay, so is that just a kind of theoretical question or is it a real question? I'm not sure now. Um, is that a result of really bad karma? Uh, maybe. I don't know. It, uh, it, maybe you have just developed a certain character that people, I don't know what's going on. Maybe people, maybe there's a, it's hard to say. I'm sure there are some people who like you uh, because uh, the world is so varied. Uh, there's always people there out there who like anyone, really. Uh, um, so I think the answer to this is that whether it's the result of bad karma is kind of irrelevant. Uh, don't worry about why things are the way they are. Instead, look for the solution. And the solution to these things is to become a really kind person. That is always the answer. And if you are kind and you show your, you know, your compassion and understanding for the world, people start to like you. You can guarantee that. I think back when I was young, yeah, I, was, I, wasn't, as, I wasn't as nice as I am. And maybe, I'm not sure how nice I am now, but I was even worse when I was younger. And people like me much more now, I think, than they used to. In the old days, you know, I didn't have that many friends. I think people sort of uh, dismissed me a little bit. I'm like, I'm not sure. But I can see the big change in me. And I, I think now I get along with people far, far better than what I used to. And that has to do with the change in my character by developing these things. So if you keep on developing kindness and compassion and understanding for the people, I guarantee you that that will change everything for you. But give it time. Don't expect results straight away. Don't be kind so that people shall like you. Because if you do that, that also has too much vested interest in it. Be kind for its own sake, because you know it's good. Because you feel good about yourself. And then a kind of added benefit would be that people like you. But don't do it to make people like you. Because that, that's you start looking for results and you get disappointed if they still not like you. You have all these negative things. Just creating more of a self out of these things. But that is the benefit of this. And... The Buddha says that if you have metta, then gods and human beings will like you. Even the gods, even the gods will like you, right? Isn't that kind of cool? The gods will like you. The devas will look out for you and they will look after you. And if something goes wrong in your life, maybe they will help you out. Yeah, maybe they will come and kind of rescue you at the last minute when you're about to make a big mistake. The devas will come and they will stick their little hands into the human world and kind of, you know, sort, help you out at the right time. Uh, guardian angels, they sometimes call that in kind of the Western tradition. Uh, isn't that kind of a nice idea? Uh, the devas are there looking out for you. Uh, but don't rely on the devas. Uh, yeah? mm -hmm. Rely on yourself. Uh, do what is right because it's good. All right. Uh, <coughs> Dear Raja, is there a sutta that gives practical advice on guarding the five senses. Uh, a separation, what would you, a separate question, what, what would you say to someone who says that we are practicing is a lower inferior vehicle? What is a smart and effective response? <laughs> You want to have kind of the cutting response, is that right? The kind of... <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so Sutta that gives a practical advice on guarding the senses. Um, really, the way to guard the senses is to be wise, yeah? to use wisdom. And I've always made the point that it is about wisdom, not so much about willpower that actually enables the guarding of the senses. Uh, and the kind of wisdom that you need is explained in such suttas. Actually, we're going to look at some of these suttas later on, on this retreat. So that's good news. Uh, is things like the Dvela Vitaka Sutta, the two kinds of thought, Majjhimanikai 19, the uh, Vitaka Santana Sutta, the calming of thought, Majjhimanikai 20. Uh, yeah, we're going to look at those. Uh, so middle length sayings 19 and 20 are really good uh, for how to sort out your thinking, basically. And guarding of the senses is very much about sorting out your thinking yeah? because you're thinking about things in an, uh, in an unskillful way basically uh, so look at those two suttas uh, they are one of my some of my favorites uh, if you want to overcome ill will uh, a good sutta for that which is not mentioned here is found in the numerical discourses uh, yeah the Anguttara Nikaya 
uh, the fifth chapter, the chapter on five, Sutta number 162, uh, the Agata Padivinaya Sutta, the overcoming of resentment. Uh, quite a well-known sutta, and it's very, very beautiful and very powerful how to stop ill will, really. Uh, and this, to me, is what guarding the senses is about. If you can avoid ill will from arising, and you can avoid also too much desires from arising, then you're on the right track, yeah. Some are practiced in the lower inferior vehicle, right? So this is the uh, Hinayana, right? The inferior vehicle. Now you can say you practice in the vehicle of the Buddha, yeah? I am practicing the vehicle of the Buddha. I don't know what you're practicing, but I am the Buddha's disciple. <laughs> right? I mean, what, what do you want to be? Do you want to be the disciple of the Buddha or do you want to be the disciple of someone else? Uh, yeah, the Buddha is the best. Buddha is number one. Everyone else in the history of Buddhism, for the last two and a half centuries, everyone else apart from the Buddha is a disciple of the Buddha. If you are a disciple of Buddha, you are in very good company. Everyone should be a disciple of the Buddha. These are the people who claim to be whatever. Yeah? If they read the suttas and they practice according to that, they too are disciples of the Buddha. If they practice according to something else, they are disciples of someone else. Yeah? So ask them what they read yeah? and figure that out. Uh, and if they read the same as you, then you can give them a high five. Okay, we're both <laughs> disciples of the Buddha. If they read something dodgy, you can tell them actually they are practicing the inferior vehicle, you are practicing the real, the real deal. Yeah? <laughs> There's so much kind of uh, silliness when it comes to these sort of things. Yeah? And um, people don't really know what they're talking about. They don't know what inferior means or superior means. Uh, they just have this idea that I've kind of been imprinted into them, yeah, throughout the youth, they've been told that Mahayana is better than Theravada because Mahayana, we have kind of, we are in evolution on the early suttas, yeah, we have kind of gone beyond the kind of simplicity of the early suttas. Now we practice to become Buddhas. They are only Arahants, yeah, Arahants, they are lesser, the Buddhas are the real deal there. But of course, all that is just nonsense, so don't worry about it. We can talk more about that later on if you wish. Be a disciple of the Buddha, that's all that really matters. Uh, if you call yourself Mahayana or Theravada, that's irrelevant uh, as long as you are a disciple of the Buddha. So this means we can bring people together a little bit. We don't need these kind of divisions. Uh, yeah, if everyone agrees that we should be a disciple of the Buddha, uh, we can take away some of these divisions between people uh, and we can be friends with everyone. Uh, Sometimes you will find that there are Mahayana people who practice better than Theravada people, right? And they're more in line with the early suttas than some Theravada people. You may find people in Tibetan Buddhism, Vajrayana, who are more in line with the early suttas. So let's try to move away from these kind of distinctions and barriers that kind of, you know, hinder harmony. And instead, try, let's try to find some common ground by agreeing that we all respect the Buddha. We all want to practice his teachings. And usually you find that everyone will agree with that. So uh, there are some Mahayana scholars who say precisely that the teachings of the Buddha are found in the suttas, also known as the Agamas. Yeah, they're found there. They know that. And so there's a lot of common ground between the various schools. And that creates more harmony. We don't have to put each other down and pretend that anyone is superior. It depends on what you do. All right. Oh, this is a long one. Gee, this is a whole essay. <laughs> okay, so this is going to take a long time to read. So I'll put that. I'll pull it. I'll put that to one side, and we'll come back to that one later on and see if I have any energy to read all of that. Okay. Uh, so here we go. I really feel that urgency you spoke about, especially when I think about the unlikelihood of becoming a stream mentor in this lifetime. Uh, when I'm on retreat, I'm not as distracted by sensory pleasures and don't worry about external responsibilities. Uh, is it how I wish life was like all the time? It is like, okay. How do you know if, when you are ready to be ordained? Uh, and is it like a constant retreat? Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Does that mean you should not ordain? Is that what kind of the... No? <laughs> okay. So the, how do you know that you know, if, when you're ready to ordain? So basically what you should do, go to a monastery, 
hang out with the monastics for a while and see what it feels like, right? Are you, do you enjoy staying in a monastery here? Yeah. That is often a very kind of... Uh, uh, it may, gives you some clarity about what monastic life is about. Uh, actually, I'm really glad to get these kind of questions, you know? And please ask these kind of questions. This is wonderful. Uh, there's nothing more I like to hear than people who are actually interested in monastic life. It's such a wonderful thing here. Yeah. Because if you want to take this path seriously, really seriously, huh? yeah, then this is the ideal way of doing it. Otherwise, the Buddha wouldn't have established the monastic life. It's kind of bleeding obvious. And many people do not have the opportunity, huh? and I get that. Huh? But if you have the opportunity, it's a wonderful to hear that people have an interest. Huh? So try it out. Come and stay. Come and stay at Bodhinyana Monastery for a while. Hang out with the monks. Go to Dhammasara Monastery or go to Venerable Chanda's place and stay there for a while and see what happens uh, and see what it feels like, uh, right? Uh, and then uh, you will have some idea of whether it is for you or not. Uh, um, is it like a constant retreat? Uh, it is like constant Dhamma practice. Uh, that's what it is. Uh, because one of the differences between lay life and monastic life, it is not that you are constant. You don't really want to be constant in retreat anyway because it is just too much. Uh, Except if you have jhanas. If you have jhanas, okay, you can be a constant retreat. Eh? But for most people, you need a bit of variety. You need to make good karma by being generous. Yeah, I mean, this is what I try to do when I come here. I try to be generous. You are generous towards me. I try to be generous towards you. Yeah, we're working together, generous to each other, eh? making some good karma in the monastic life. Eh? And uh, that means doing the chores in the monastery, doing a bit of building work, doing a bit of teaching, uh, translating, whatever it is, uh, reading some suttas. Uh. So it's not as if you're constantly on retreat, uh, but everything you do is aimed towards Dhamma. That is the important point. Uh. You are surrounded by monastics who remind you that Dhamma is what life is about. You don't get distracted in the same way as you are in lay life. You are around other people who are, think like you. Yeah, everyone is pulling in the same direction. In lay life, it's like you are going one direction, everyone else is going the opposite direction. Right? And that is very tiring after a while because you have to go, really have to go against the stream. Whereas the stream in monastic life tends to pull you along. It's like you are there, you're in the kind of the, uh, you're kind of uh, in the slipstream of these giants of the Dhamma. Yeah? Ajahn Brahm goes first and you kind of just walk behind him, right? You're in the slipstream of Ajahn Brahm. Yeah? It's like, it makes it much easier. Or you, basically we're all in the slipstream of the Buddha, really. Yeah? Yeah? And he kind of is pulling us along in this way. Yeah? It makes it easier. Yeah? There's lots of advantages of living monastic life. I think people don't really quite appreciate uh, how significant it is and what a shift it is from lay life uh, because of the environment, uh, because of the ability to live in a cutie by yourself, uh, because of the support you get from the lay community. Uh, that in itself is very touching. Uh, you stay in the monastery, you do your meditation, uh, you come out for the meal and people travel yeah, for an hour and a half. They make food, they get up at four in the morning, they cook for the monastics, travel all the way to the monastery, spend enormous amounts of money and resources to make all this food, offer it to the monks, yeah, and I just come out and all this food comes into the monastery. It's like magic. Ajahn Brahm calls it meals on wheels, yeah, <laughs> driving it into the monastery. And so they come in and then you, they offer the food to you. And it's beautiful food. Yeah, they always cook the best for the monastics. It's kind of astonishing. Yeah? And then afterwards they go and wash up. Uh, and then they give a donation. It's like, it's unbelievable how the system works, right? Uh, and it's so beautiful. And it's really, really uplifting if you are a monastic. Just to see this happening is actually very beautiful. Yeah? And so there's a beautiful exchange between the lay community and the monastic community. Yeah? And as a monastic, of course, then you, it inspires you to do the very best in your monastic life uh, and to give some teachings back uh, and to do the things in the right way. Uh. So everything in monastic life is uh, geared towards Dhamma. Everything is really powerful and beautiful. Uh. One other thing about monastic life is that you meet so many nice people. Uh. Yeah, when I travel around the world, I, it's very, very occasional you might get abused. Yeah, somebody call you a... Uh, Hare Krishna, get out of the way, or whatever, something like that, right? And uh, people who are completely ignorant, they have no idea what's going on. But anyway, uh, 
And, uh, but usually people are extraordinarily kind to you and very supportive and very sort of, and, and what a wonderful thing that is, uh, to feel that you are treated with kindness almost everywhere you go. Uh, it's very, very, it's wonderful. Uh, and then, uh, as a monastic, because you have a bit more authority, uh, you become a blessing for many people in the world. Uh, and one of the people that you become a blessing for, which is really nice, is your own family. Uh, when I go back to no, I will be going to Norway after spending my time here in the UK. I will be doing a weekend retreat. Usually my brother comes on my weekend retreats. And that's kind of extraordinary. And he brings his son, yeah, who is kind of 18 or whatever. He comes along on the retreat. And then I go visit my mum. And my mum says, okay, let's do some meditation together. Right? Isn't that wonderful? And it's kind of, you become like a, a resource for the people who are closest to you. Some of my friends from university, they listen to my talks online. It's kind of extraordinary when these things happen. And all of this is very beautiful and very inspiring and very, it's just really uplifting. And these are things you don't get in lay life in the same way. There's lots of benefits of being a monastic. So really try it out. It may be that it is not for you. Yeah, maybe there are reasons why it is hard for you, but try it out. However, if you are going to be a monastic, make sure you do it well. Do it in a good place where you feel that you are well supported, etc., etc. And that's why I always recommend people, if you're thinking of ordaining, check out a few different monasteries. Don't go to only one place, because when you have an ability to kind of compare, and you can make a good choice. Yeah, so come down and visit us in Perth. Uh, maybe check out some monasteries in Thailand. There's some monasteries here in the UK you can check out. Uh, yeah? And get the feeling for what is a good place for you. Uh, how do you choose a monastery? <coughs> Go for the feeling rather than for the in intellect. Uh, don't think that, okay, in this monastery they're teaching the right thing. Yeah, it doesn't, the atmosphere is not so good, but I know they're teaching the right things. So I'll go with that. Uh, no, go where you feel the atmosphere is right. Uh, what feels right is far more important because meditation is about being at ease. It's about being able to find joy and happiness. If the feeling is good, your meditation will work. If you're coming from an intellectual point of view, yeah, what you think is right, usually what you think is right is not right anyway because we are all a bit deluded when we start out, actually it's not going to work. So go with your feelings. And that is a far better way of deciding what is right. I mean, I'm not saying you should kind of leave all logic to one side. We use a bit of both. But feeling of the monastery is very important. It should be a good place where you feel at ease and relaxed and you're enjoying your stay here. All right. So that is just a little bit of advice on uh, um, how to choose a monastery and how, whether you should ordain or not. Uh, Dear Adela, I have a question about sense restraint and uh, attitude to food. What does it say in the suttas? Thank you. So, uh, attitude to food is enjoy the food. Actually, the Buddha doesn't say that. This is what Ajahn Brahm says. Yeah, he says, enjoy your meal. Yeah, have a good. And I think that is a very wise advice, to be honest with you. Uh, um, the problem with uh, food yeah, and sense of strength in regard to food is look at what happens to your mind in the afternoon. Yeah? If you sit here in the afternoon and evening and you think about food all the time, then you have a problem. That is the problem you should look out for. If you enjoy the food at the meal time, no problem at all. In fact, I will, I'm going to bet with you that if you don't enjoy the food yeah, at the meal time, chances are greater that you will think about food in the evening. Yeah? Yeah, because it didn't have that enjoyment before, the idea of food is going to be more powerful for you. But if you have a nice meal and you eat enough and you really just enjoy what is going there, you will forget about food in the afternoon. It won't be a problem. I never think about food in the afternoon. Never happens. Maybe it has happened very, very occasionally, but it's extremely rare. Maybe because I didn't have anything to eat or something like that, and maybe you might think a bit about food. That is what matters, yeah? where your mind goes in the evening and when you don't eat. That is how you know whether you have a problem with sense restraint or not. It is not about not enjoying your food. So please enjoy the food. That is okay. That is not really the issue here. So should you be mindful when you eat? 
this is one of those things that you will often learn or hear in Buddhist circles that when you eat, eat mindfully. Huh? But what exactly does that mean? Does that mean, okay, lifting, 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 eating, <laughs> chewing, chewing, chewing? Yeah. To, to my mind, it does not really mean that. Uh, yeah? This is kind of this idea again, that, that you should be mindful because mindfulness begets mindfulness. Uh, it's that kind of idea. Uh, the way that uh, if you look at the Satisampajanya, the mindfulness and clear comprehension, the way it is explained, uh, actually what it means is mindfulness about eating. Yeah? So it is about eating the right amount, uh, eating the right kind of food. Uh, yeah? Eating in a way that sustains your life in the right way, not eating too much so you feel you can't meditate in the afternoon, not eating too little so you feel hungry in the evening. Yeah? It's mindfulness about food, not mindfulness while you're eating. Well, I mean, you need a little bit of mindfulness while you're eating, but it's about eating in the right way, not simply about mindfulness in its own right. This is this idea again that mindfulness should have a purpose. It shouldn't just be mindfulness for its own sake, but mindfulness with a very clear purpose, so it supports your practice down the track. That is the purpose of mindfulness while you're eating. But too often is this idea that you're just mindful for mindfulness' sake. Yeah? But actually, I can't see any evidence for that in the suttas. And I actually know where the idea comes from. Uh, it's going to be too complicated for me to explain, I think. Uh, actually, I did, exp did explain that the other day. Maybe I did a little bit. The idea, again, is that uh, very briefly, uh, sati sampajanya, yeah, which is this formula which says by going forward you are clear comprehension by going backwards, you have clear comprehension. Going, looking aside, looking this way, that way, you have clear comprehension. Stretching your limbs, you have clear comprehension. Eating and drinking, you have clear comprehension. Uh, speaking and being silent, sleeping and being awake, you have clear comprehension. And that is the giveaway right there. You have clear comprehension and mindfulness while sleeping. It cannot be while sleeping, it must be about sleep, right? Because that's the only way it makes any sense. So you have clear comprehension about sleeping. Yeah? In other words, you sleep enough. Uh, you don't sleep too much. Uh, you have the right kind of bed, uh, these kind of things. It's about, and that about concerns all of those elements in the clear comprehension formula. Once you kind of get that key to the meaning, it becomes obvious. Uh, and then you need to understand that it does not belong inside the Satipatthana Sutta. It belongs prior to Satipatthana. These are the things, how we live our daily life, to enable meditation to work later on. That is the way I see this. Okay, good luck. So, Dear Ajahn, can you expand on the Buddha's teachings being the meaning of life? People often create their own meaning. Are they delusional? <laughs> uh, thank you for thank you for something. Yeah. Okay, probably something nice. I can't quite make out your handwriting, but I, I take it. Uh, thank you for your wisdom. Ah, oh, that's it. That's very nice. Okay, so <laughs> so uh, <laughs> uh, yes, it is about the meaning of life, and um, the way to understand that is simply that. Uh, uh, in ordinary life, we have all of these desires and these cravings, uh, yeah, and these desires and cravings, uh, where are they, what do they actually want? Uh, and what they really want is they, what we really want is to find satisfaction somehow, yeah, that's what that craving is all about. Uh, and the craving will tell you, if you get this, if you get that, then you will be satisfied, but it never really turns out to be true. Uh, you never find that satisfaction. Uh, Yet that satisfaction can be found, and it can be found on the spiritual path. We have been looking in the wrong place all the time. And when you find the complete satisfaction, the complete contentment, where there is no more desire and craving, well, you have found that thing, that craving wanted you to find and to begin with. That is the answer to the meaning of life. When you have no basis for moving anymore, when you have no basis for doing anything because you're fully content, there's nothing more to be done. That means, by definition, you found the meaning of life, because there's nothing more to do. Okay, you must have found the meaning. Where do you find that meaning? Number one, in deep samadhi. Deep samadhi, you become completely immobile. You don't want anything apart from the bliss you have right now. The problem is, you come out from that samadhi. Yeah, and then you kind of back to square one. Well, that's not really true. Square two, maybe. <laughs> uh, 
And so, and then you, uh, um, uh, you have to have the insight, because the insight ends that craving once and for all. Uh, yeah? So uh, this is why it is the meaning of life. Uh, because you actually find, find that answer, that deep inside of us, uh, every one of us is looking for all the time. Uh, we are driven towards something. Craving and desire drives us on in life. Uh, we're driven, really, because we're seeking satisfaction in a very deep way. We never find it. We've always been looking in the wrong place. Now we have the path to that satisfaction. Uh, All right. Okay, dear Ajahn, what exactly is attention? If everything that is occurring is already in awareness, then attention seems to be a limitation or selective strengthening of awareness. That's pretty, pretty good, yeah? I would say that you're very much on track there. No one is actually doing uh, doing that, what is really going on? Yeah, so uh, attention. The idea here is that we attend in a particular way. Yeah? Attention is whatever is in your consciousness right now. So if you are listening to what I'm saying, you're attending to that. That is your attention. Uh, and so in Buddhism, we try to train our attention so that we attend to things that are useful. We don't attend to things that are not useful there. Uh, and we try to bring wisdom with our attention, yeah? So that when you attend to a person, you, have, you feel kindness towards them, rather than feeling ill will or whatever. So you attend and you attend with wisdom. And then in meditation, we train to attend on the breath, right? We learn how to do that in such a way that we enjoy the breath meditation. So you're training your attention in a particular way. So... Um, yeah, so everything that's occurring is already in awareness, and attention seems to be a limitation or selective strengthening. Yeah, so you are selecting certain things and you attend to those. That's exactly right. And you attend to them in a particular way. It's also the quality of attention, right? That is important here. Yeah? If no one is actually doing that, what is really going on? It's the conditioning that is doing it for you. Yeah, by listening to the word of the Buddha, you get conditioned to attend in a certain way. The Buddha says, be kind, and so you are kind. Is it coming from you or is it coming from the Buddha? Well, it's you know certainly coming from the Buddha. If you didn't have that conditioning, you might not be quite as kind as you are because of the Buddha. Uh, why do you come on these meditation retreats? Well, probably Buddhism has a lot to do with it, right? That's why you are here, otherwise you wouldn't come here. So, uh, what is doing it? The conditioning is doing it. It feels like you're doing it, but uh, that may not turn out to be actually not to be correct. Okay, I'm going to take a deep breath and <laughs> read this long question over here. I don't, I don't want, it would be unfair not to, uh, not to read it, so I'm going to read it out. So, dear Bhante, many thanks for your marvelous teachings. They are highly motivational as well, I have to say. In my, if my memory serves me right, two ways of knowing the significance of a sutta have been mentioned. One is how much the content of the sutta is repeated. The other is if the Lord Buddha himself says it is important. Uh, please kindly correct me if I've under, misunderstood. You have understood very well. Going by this criteria, the Satipatthana Sutta is also important, isn't it? Uh, to my knowledge, it is repeated in two places, in the Majjhima Nikaya and the Diga Nikaya. The significance is pointed out by the Lord Buddha uh, at the start of the Sutta by saying something like, Ekayano Mago, please correct me if I'm wrong. So, okay, so let's start with that. It is true, it does occur in two places. One is Majjhima Nikaya number 10, the other one is Diga Nikaya number 22. Uh, but they are the same sutta, yeah? Uh, if you look at other schools of Buddhism, it occurs only once. Uh, so it's very quite clear that in the Pali version, it has basically been duplicated. So it now exists in the Diga and the Majjhima Nikaya, but really there is only one version of the Satipatthana Sutta. Otherwise, we have to think that he, it is, the sutta was 
taught in a place called Kammasadamma in the Kuru country, which is a very obscure place. Very few suttas were taught there. So did he actually teach the full Satipatthana Sutta twice in this tiny little place far away and nowhere else? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah? All the evidence points to the fact that this was, Sutta was duplicated and then expanded uh, and became the Maha Satipatthana Sutta in the Diga Nikaya. It was expanded with a large amount of material, much of that taken from the Satchavibhanga Sutta, which is the Majjhima Nikaya 141, and it was incorporated in that Maha Satipatthana Sutta. It is almost like an Abhidhamma exposition in that particular sutta because it goes on forever expanding on these various terms. So that is the first thing. Yeah? I don't really think it occurs twice. It really occurs once, but it has been duplicated yeah, through the, the uh, history of textual transmission. And this happens sometimes. And one of the reasons why this happens is because in the early days of the suttas, the Various, there were what is called Banakas, and Banakas were the people who recited the suttas. And there were various kind of groupings and schools of Banakas. And some of these Banakas, they specialized in the Diga Nikaya, some specialized in the Majjhima Nikaya, some in the Sangyuta Nikaya. And because they specialized on various collections, the suttas were sometimes duplicated so that all the groups of Banakas would have what they considered important suttas, right? So in this case, the, um, uh, this sutta was considered to be uh, important. They needed something on meditation in the Diga Nikaya, and so they duplicated and put it in there. Not because it was spoken twice by the Buddha, but because they wanted these Banakas to be able to recite the Satipatthana Sutta. That is one reason why these things happened. And this is how the discourses were kind of... Uh, divided between the various collections, yeah? And that division between various collections varies depending on the school of Buddhism that you have. Uh, on the schools of Buddhism, like the Sarvastivada, there is no indication that the Satipatthana Sutta, it only uh, uh, seems to have occurred once in that collection, uh, and similar elsewhere. Uh. So uh, that gives the idea that uh, uh, yeah, that this is not as significant as it may seem. Eka yano mago, what exactly does that mean? Eka means one, yano means going. So eka yano means going to one, or maybe one going. It is a lot highly discussed term, what actually this means. And the usual interpretation is that it is a path going to one destination, right? That doesn't make the sutta special because the whole Eightfold Path goes to one destination. It just means that Satipatthana is part of the Noble Eightfold Path and of course it goes to one destination. If it didn't go to that destination it would be useless. That's kind of obvious. But there is another interpretation of Ekayana which has been suggested by Bhante Sujato who has done a translation of these things. And he argues that Ekayana means going to one which is another interpretation. Going to one means going to samadhi. One is samadhi, right? Ekata is the same as eka. Ekayana, going to samadhi. And that makes a lot of sense when you start to see the noble eightfold path. The purpose of Satipatthana is to take you to samadhi. That is a very interesting argument. Is it correct? I don't know, but it's interesting. <laughs> And so uh, we have this various interpretation. One of the interesting things, of course, is that uh, sometimes different interpretations are all correct. There isn't one right answer to these things. Uh, so a term like ekayana, which is not very clearly defined, may have many meanings. It may mean going to one. It may also mean the path that goes to one destination, uh, like nibbana or whatever, yeah? the one going path. So they're actually very closely related to each other, these ideas. And so, but it does not mean that this is some kind of special sutta. That is not what Ekayana means. The Satipatthana Sutta is no less and also no more important than other suttas. In fact, if you really want to understand Satipatthana, what you have to do is you have to read, read the Satipatthana Sangyutta, the connected discourses on Satipatthana. So you need to go to the Sangyutta Nikaya, read all the discourses there, there's about 55 discourses or something, 
That is when you really start to understand what Satipatthana is about. We need a broad view of these things. The Satipatthana Sutta is only one among these 55 suttas, and it does not deserve any kind of special place. It is one among many here. Okay. Given the importance of the Satipatthana Sutta, isn't it detrimental to the teaching that, uh, what some Buddhist scholars have done by comparing the same sutta from multiple schools and languages and saying that some parts uh, have been later added? I don't think it's detrimental at all. I think, it is, I think it's great because they are... Remember that what we are trying to do here, we're trying to find out what the Buddha taught, right? That is what is important. Uh, what is important is not to hold on to any one tradition or grasp onto one or any particular thing. The idea is try to come as close as we can to the word of the Buddha. And if we can use the broader range of texts that exist to come closer to the word of the Buddha, we're doing a benefit to Buddhism. And we're helping everyone to understand better what the real practice is. So Satipatthana Sutta, again, is one sutta among many. And if we can understand better what it is about, that's a wonderful thing, and we should do that. However, I can understand that people are concerned, because it may be very difficult for most people to really know whether this scholarship is right or not. Yeah? And I can see why that is problematic. How can you trust that this scholarship is correct? Who should you believe if one person says that Satipatthana Sutta is the most important teaching of the Buddha, practice it exactly as it says in the suttas, and another scholar says that no, actually it is not uh, more important than other suttas, and it can be, we can produce a more original version. How do you know how good to trust? Yeah, and I can see why people find this difficult, and I, I can sympathize with that. So just listen to the arguments. See what you think is more convincing, yeah? and then go with what you feel your faith and confidence is leaning. Yeah? That is what you should do. Huh? And in the end, uh, um, you know, in the end, that's really all you can do, huh? right? Uh, listen to the arguments and see what seems more convincing to you. Huh? So personally, I, I don't have much doubt that uh, this way of analyzing actually works really, really well and actually probably is, uh, is correct. And uh, so, uh, but anyway, you have to figure that out for yourself, unfortunately. Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> how can they be so sure of this? Isn't it possible that some schools, like the Theravada tradition, have meticulously preserved the original teaching while other schools fail to do this? Isn't it possible that opinionated venerables in the other schools removed parts of it, just going by the statistics and judging what is correct and considering the majority can be flawed? Isn't that the case? Yes, that is the case. Everything can be flawed. Other schools can have removed. But remember that some of the schools have more than the Theravada. Some schools have less, some schools have more. Within Theravada itself, some versions of Satipatthana are shorter than others within the same school, right? For example, in the Theravada, we have, as you mentioned, two versions of the Satipatthana Sutta. One is in the Diga Nikaya, one in the Majjhima Nikaya. One is much longer than the other. Then we have a version in the Abhidhamma. The Abhidhamma version is much shorter than the one in the Suttas. Maybe the Abhidhamma version in this case is more original because it is shorter. Maybe it's in the same school, right? It's not different schools. It's kind of weird. Why does the Abhidhamma have a shorter version when the Abhidhamma is later? And then you go to some of the Sarvastivadana school has added many additional things to the, to the uh, Satipatthana Sutta. Then you go to the Abhidhamma of the Sarvastivadana, and that is shorter than the Sarvastivadana <laughs> Sutta. So it is very confusing. It is all kind of things going on here. And so you eventually you come to the conclusion, because there are so many versions with different lengths and things, uh, you realize that some kind of evolution has been going on, that something has been happening to the sutta. Huh? And uh, the argument is that the Satipatthana Sutta may in fact turn out to be the most added to sutta in the whole Tipitaka or the whole Sutta Pitaka. Huh? Which is kind of extraordinary considering how highly it is held in regard sometimes. Uh, Anyway, I know these things are controversial, so uh, uh, take it 
as you see fit. This might sound silly, but why can't some Venables with psychic powers go to the Deva realm and ask the Deva who had directly listened to the Satipatthana Sutta when it was preached, rather than resorting to these academic comparisons only? Wouldn't such claims by the scholars instill doubt about the Dhamma in lay people, given the timescales in their realms? In some realms, only days would have passed since the teaching was made. Great if Bhante could kindly express thoughts on this. Apologies for the length, yeah. Okay, so good. I came to the end of your question. That's great. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I think what if you went to the Deva Loka, what you probably would find is that one Deva would say it is like this, another Deva would say it is like that, right? <laughs> That's the problem, just like these various schools have different ideas, because maybe one Deva belongs to the Sarvastivan school, the other Deva belongs to the Theravada school. Right? So I, I don't think you would resolve anything actually by going to the devas, and this is kind of the problem. I don't think there is any solution. And who would believe you anyway? Yeah, I went, I went to the devas, right? Yeah. Sure, you went to the devas, yeah, okay. Yeah. And then you'd be written off as a nutcase if you said that sort of thing. So, you, <laughs> so I, the problem is that there isn't really any good answers, yeah? And in the end, uh, what we have to do is we have to apply our common sense to try to understand these things. Uh, and yes, it is controversial because it goes against the grain. And I remember when I first came to these comparative studies, I too kind of rejected it initially. I thought, what? What are you talking about? This, this, you know, I, I have faith in these suttas. But as I reflected on it and as I started to understand what is going on, I realized actually it is a silly just to reject these things. I was coming from, I realized from emotions or from attachments to something. It wasn't really rational what I was doing. And then as I started to think, I realized that some of these scholars actually have done some very interesting work, and I should really get into this. And as I did that, I started to understand that actually there's something very important going on here. We're never going to recreate the Buddha's word exactly, because the Buddha's word is kind of lost in history, but we have enough to know what the Buddha taught. We're never going to have verbatim the word of the Buddha, but we're going to be close enough to know his teachings, yeah? Noble Eightfold Path, Four Noble Truths, Dependent Origination, all of these things we can be very sure are the word of the Buddha because they are the same across the board, all schools and everything like that. So, but there are going to be problems sometimes. And when you see that the suttas are very different in different schools, that is where the question marks start to arise. Who got it right? Who got it wrong? And we should not just because we come from a Theravadan background, we should not assume that we necessarily have it right. We should be more open-minded than that. We should remember that every school got some things right, every school got some things wrong. I would say that as far as the suttas in the Nikayas are concerned, the Theravadan suttas, they are generally better than any other suttas. They have been generally very, very well preserved. And... But that does not mean that in every case they have been better preserved, right? It is important to be humble about this. It's important to understand that no one is perfect. Everyone makes mistakes. And if we can correct some of the problems in the Theravadan Suttas by using other schools, it's wonderful. And in some cases, it is absolutely obvious that actually the Theravadans have made mistakes. There is one Sutta where it starts off by saying there are these six things and it only mentions five. Right? And then the other school actually has all six. Obviously, something has been lost in the Theravadan Sutta. So it's okay. Sometimes we need that extra input to make sense of things. So anyway, uh, I apologize for still having left quite a few unasked, uh, unanswered. So hopefully we can do that tomorrow evening. I promise that by the end of this retreat, everything will be answered. I guarantee that. Every retreat is the same. Everything is always answered at the end, even if it means having to go a bit faster towards the end. So that is all for tonight. And I wish you, as always, a very good night. Please have a wonderful rest. And then get ready for tomorrow morning. Bright and clear. And we'll carry on tomorrow morning. And now let's just pay respect to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha to finish off. Arahang Sama Sambudo Bhagava Bodhang Bhagavantang 
आपे बाधे में स्वाकाचो भागवता दमो धामाग नमस्सामि सुपाते पानो भागवतो सावकासंगो सांगनामा 